The topics cover a variety of straggling notions clinging to Aristotle's proposed dialectic, and certain profound, if brief, commentaries on topics more contained within the world of real problems than of abstract ones. One concern is that dialectic arguments are put to situations which can neither be observed nor demonstrated. It is important to question whether it is the role of a philosopher to prove or disprove nebulous things currently outside of the human faculty. Should we, for example, lend our efforts to prove a god true or false, or should we rather focus on developing the engines of observation that could readily put that answer within our grasp? Should we fixate on the possibility of us living within a digital simulation and teach of that simulation, or should we be refining our ability to observe digital simulations? Is free will a question for philosophers, or for particle physicists and neurologists? Is the practice of philosophy merely about proposing what-if scenarios, which are possibly true, or is it about finding a means of assigning probabilities to possible states? In consideration of this, Aristotle attempts to refine the way we observe truth by negating errors through a number of refining tools for the construction of syllogisms. These are processes he believes necessary to undertake prior to placing terms within any argumentative framework. The assumption of propositions is the process of checking one's premises for truth to the best of one's ability, which likely has to be done by showing a statement is demonstrably true, or by recourse to a prior argument. In light of this, it is essential to any scientific inquiry that the causative states are true, or at some point have been true, and the gold standard would be to have causes which are replicable. This step is essential in separating a demonstrative prediction from a prophecy. Prophecies predict what will happen from a place where one or more causes are false, and as such they aren't actually capable of producing a counterexample. Check your premises is one way of saying not to assume propositions, though in cases where current observations are clearly true but inconsistent with information which is more distantly obtained, it can be called updating your priors. A third term, checking your privilege, is making certain that your assumption of propositions isn't based on states which are only true from a particular observational standpoint. The distinction of the equivocal is in making certain that terms are not confused in any way with similar concepts that tie into their category. In almost every case, what we think of as two words for the same thing actually have subtle shades of meaning that divide them. When forming an argument, synonyms and euphemisms should be avoided so that identical terms repeat themselves consistently throughout the argument. The discovery of differences follows on from this in making the limitations of an argument clear, namely in not making the common error that what is a true relationship between species does not indicate a true relationship between their genuses. For example, if natural selection consists of eugenic action over time, that does not mean all evolution consists of eugenic action over time, because evolution also consists of dysgenic mutations. The consideration of the similar is a final regard in which one sets a point of observable equivalence between singular entities, admitting and reminding that singulars exist in the real world, whereas similarity is only ever an abstraction which can be said to apply to a limited range of singular things. The more sensitive the measure, the greater the difference between two similar entities will become. This consideration chooses a maximum point of sensitivity and rounds off any measure beyond it. These four steps accounted for, one can avoid the dangers posed by generalization and proceed with a deductive argument. Another important point addressed in the topics 
is that of comparing accident with predication. This is the understanding that no argument made has to be obviously false with every demonstration of terms, nor will one be true with every similar demonstration of terms. At any time, a term or singular or complex form which appears similar to other singulars can emerge within a data set and disprove a theorized form of similarity, rejecting the old conclusion and demanding a more nuanced one in its place. So, if the presiding theory is that all swans are white, the appearance of a single black swan is enough to reject the theory and replace it with two more hypotheses, that some swans are white and some swans are black. The black swan can't be seen as an exception to the rule. Broken rules fixed by the same material of which they were made will break again and again. Logic abandons such broken rules and replaces them with ones made from different materials, in better shapes which do not break again. It is important in this to recognize that syllogistic forms themselves are not exempt from the wrath of a black swan. If in any case a pair of premises are essentially and demonstrably true and lead to a false conclusion, then that syllogistic form ceases to be regarded as valid, and all other truths derived from it are no longer considered to be validly derived. Aristotle's syllogisms are very simple forms, and have been tested by him and others in countless ways over the centuries, and never proven to be invalid. More complicated argumentative forms have had a less promising history in the right of their proving. As a final draw from the many ideas available in the topics, I'd like to highlight the way Aristotle sees fit to oppose ideas which seem true, but are not. He compares the rhetorician to a thief, a species of criminal whose intent is not only to steal, but to steal without being noticed. The thief's success depends on two necessary states, and either can be made false to prevent a thievery. One can attempt to stop them from stealing, or one can make sure that they are observed while doing so. The security of one's person can be achieved by building walls or by placing alarms. Building walls against a rhetorician wasn't something Aristotle considered as particularly effective. Unless one is willing to contain oneself and one's neighbors within a labyrinth, a thief or rhetorician will simply target the weakest citizen, and open minds were common in ancient Greece, as they are now. Instead, Aristotle believed it necessary to catch a dialectician in the course of their own arguments by setting up conditions in which their conclusions were obviously false when put to reality. He also stressed that it was important that the argument be proved ridiculous rather than the interlocutor themselves, because even if a rhetorician was struck down, a persuasive argument they proposed could be picked up and defended by any opponent. If one cannot directly insert deductive logic as a premise to destabilize an interlocutor's argument, which would be the most favorable method, the typical strategy would be to argue to absurdity or to the impossible. This is, in short, the technique of having a person talk themselves to death. If a rhetorician makes a false statement in conclusion to one argument, then the statement can be reworked into the premise of a different argument. Then, even if all other premises in that argument are true, the argument's conclusion will be false. The trick is to make sure that, in the second argument, all the other premises are true, and the conclusion will be readily contradicted by observable reality. So, if someone declares that the world is flat, one does not have to deny this assertion but rather demand it account for another perceivable truth, such as how long two shadows are at different meridians of a flat landscape at the same time of day. This can then be tested against the same conditions in a real setting, and be observably declared true or false. And if false, the premise of a flat earth is impossible. 